Royal House and Slave Quarters poetry series called Poetry is Protest. Tonight is a very special evening for several reasons. First, this program is part of the museum's Giving Voice annual fundraiser. As we remain closed, your donations are vital to the preservation of the Royal House and Slave Quarters and the educational work we do on the, on the lives of the enslaved people in the North. We have the absolute honor to host the incomparable Honoré Fanon Jeffers tonight for a reading from her absolutely stunning poetry collection, The Age of Phyllis. What makes this night even more special is that we are hosting this event with Professor Jeffers and her work on Phyllis Wheatley Peters, who in 1773 became the first Black woman and enslaved person in North America to publish a book on the birthdays of Toni Morrison and Audre Lorde. So without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed guest tonight so that we can start the event. Professor Jeffers is a poet, fiction writer, scholar, and essayist whose work examines culture, religion, history, and family. She is the author of five books of poetry and the recipient of two lifetime achievement notations, the Harper Lee Award for Alabama's Distinguished Writer of the Year and, the induction, and she was inducted into the Alabama Writers Hall of Fame. Jeffers has won fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Witter Biner Foundation for Poetry in conjunction with the Library of Congress. An elected member of the American Antiquarian Society, she teaches creative writing at the University of Oklahoma, where she is a professor of English. The Age of Phyllis was long listed for the 2020 National Book Award in Poetry, and Professor Phillips Professor Jeffers has been nominated for an NAACP Image Award and is one of 60 United States Artist Fellows, which is an award made possible from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Leading us in conversation tonight is Malcolm Tariq. Malcolm Tariq is a poet and playwright from Savannah, Georgia. He is the author of Heed the Hollow, which was the winner of the Cave Canem Poetry Prize and the 2020 Georgia Author of the Year Award in Poetry, and is a 2020 to 2021 resident playwright with Liberation Theater Company. Malcolm is a graduate of Emory University and holds a PhD in English from the University of Michigan. Go Blue. He lives in Brooklyn, New York, where he is the Programs and Communications Manager at Cave Canem, a home for Black poetry. So now I am going to invite Professor Jeffers uh, to read for us. Good evening. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Good evening. I am very um, thrilled to be here. And um, I'm going to do something a little different. Miss Singleton, I think I am still on the right side. So I'm not in the middle. Oh, I am front and center. Yes. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, usually I read only um, poems about um, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, who I affectionately uh, call Miss Phyllis. But um, because this is a reading at the Royal House um, and um, Mrs. Belinda Sutton was enslaved by uh, Isaac Royal, um, I thought what I would do is read poems um, that uh, are in the voices of the, the muses that um, guide my book. Um, and so what uh, The Age of Phyllis does among other things, there are a lot of things I'm trying to do in the book. What, um, what happens is I'm having her speak back to the um, Western, epic, which has the white male at the center of, of, of the epic. And so, uh, in, and so the muses are, of course, assumed to be all white women. So what I did was flip that. And I have nine Black women, Miss Phyllis, Miss Phyllis's mother, and um, Yai, 
and um, seven other black women. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with the point that, that I usually always begin with. And then I'm gonna move to the middle of the book, Muses Convening, and I'm gonna read from there. So um, I imagined the child who would be renamed Phyllis Wheatley. Um, and then she married John Peters, of course, uh, later on that she was a um, child of the Wolof uh, tribe in West Africa, in the Gambia, and we'll never know, of course. Um, this is a poem written in the voice of Yai. Yai means mother in the Wolof uh, language. There's an epigraph from the great Langston Hughes. This is a song for the genius child, sing it softly, for the song is wild. An issue of mercy, number one. Mercy, girl. What the mother might have said, pointing at the sun rising, what makes life possible, then drip the bowl of water reverent into oblivious earth. Was this prayer for her? Respect for the dead or disappeared, an act to please a genius child. Her daughter would speak of water, bowl, sun, light arriving, light gone. Sometime after the nice white lady paid and named her for the slave ship, Mercy. What the child called Phyllis would claim after that sea journey, journey, let's call it that. Let's lie to each other. Not early descent into madness, naked travail among filth and rats. What got Phyllis over that sea? What kept a stolen daughter? Perhaps it was mercy, dear Rita. Mercy, dear. Brethren, water, bowl, sun, a mothering, God's milky sound, morning shards, and a mother wondered if her daughter forgot her real name, refused to envision the rest, baby teeth missing, and somebody wrapping her treasure barely in a dirty carpet. Twas mercy. You know the story, how we've lied to each other. And now I move to the middle of the book. And um, anyone who knows me knows that Lucille Clifton uh, was incredibly important to me. She was my mentor, my friend, my second mother. And so, um, there are three epigraphs here, but one thing is I want people to keep in mind, when you hear me repeat, I say, that's Lucille Clifton's, I say. She used to um, use that, that phrase a lot. And so I call on her uh, every time. Um, so there is an epigraph from Mrs. Belinda Sutton from her petition to the Massachusetts General Court. Even when she, in a sacred grove with each hand and that of a tender parent was paying her devotions to the great Orisha who made all things. There's the second one. When Ona Judge was asked if she is not sorry, she left Washington as she has labored so much harder since than before, her reply is, no, I am free and have, I trust been made a child of God by the means. That's an interview with Ona Maria Judge. She is a former enslaved servant from uh, George Washington's household. And the very last is by Lucille Clifton from Mulberry Fields. I say the stones marked an old tongue and it was called eternity.
chorus of the mother's griot. And this is written for Phyllis Wheatley Peters and after Lucille Clifton. Amnesiac wood, nostrils of girls who was bought uncle's hand, guts on the air who was sold, defeated man, history's charnel. I say trader silver, selling not to not, naked in the corner, door of no return, sing the mutiny in the slave house, sniff Bougainvillea, who is ashamed, I say, ready Don's kill, naked in the corner, jealous sharks, I shall who did, I say they did, I'm here, my name, who shall, I say yes here, on the battlefield, call woman, call America, call revolution, call the brother, call the myth. I say, call the auction, call Africa, call the sachem. In God's name, is this called? Is my mother, is some kin, I say, is this cold? Is some water? Is my mother, I say, is this cold? Isabel. Isabel and her husband and their child, William, baptized, um, were the first recorded family in the Virginia colony. Isabel, Virginia Colony, circa 1621. Like any love should be, hers was touch and never leave. Some arguments and tears with Antony, her husband, but no freedom. They were tied, a curt blessing in that era of dark skin and kin. Separations would occur soon enough, but they had to band together. This woman and her man who might have come on a ship with 18 others. Isabel cooked for him from flesh he trapped or caught. They might've looked at the entrails of his prey to decipher what the day had been back home in Africa. What would the drums say? Was it a feast time? Was their village in the same spot? When their son was born, Isabel probably kept him away from others for several days. That night when the necessary seclusion was done, Antony would have shaved the baby's head and spat in his ear, tapped a foot on the floor, told an unforgotten story. And then Isabel, put the baby to her breast and sang, your name is William here, but mother calls you something else, something old in secret. Hager Blackmore um, accused a white man of, um, sexually assaulting her or attempting to sexually assault her. And what is so um, extraordinary about this is, you know, that she had the courage to come forth and say this, right? Say that he had done this to her. But also um, later on, um, it was impossible uh, in the South, this is in Massachusetts, for an enslaved uh, Black woman to uh, accuse anyone of, of rape because uh, there was no such thing as raping a Black woman. It was only a crime against property. Definitions of Hager Blackmore, Middlesex County, Massachusetts, April, 1669, and this is written after A. Van Jordan. One, 
Blackamore, A, Nagar, Nigger, Jigaboo, Inversion, Blacker than me. A word describing, B, a word describing many tribes, C, after the anchoring, a name separating light and dark, literate and unlettered, house and field. Two, Hagar, A, a female slave who flies away as the Greek indicates. B, someone meant to have less than whose children are meant to have less as well. C, the handmaid of Sarai, later Sarah, a slave who was given to Abram to rape since she did not give her permission to be given. D, a woman who smirks at her pale sister, if I'm not free, you can't be either. Three, Hagar Blackmore. A, a negress of the 17th century. B, a woman stolen from Angola who cannot escape category. C, a resident of an empired land. D, Sister whose spine will not touch sheet. E, a cursor of men blocking the sight of God's will. This, um, my late sister, Sidonie Colette Jeffers, was a, um, uh, a lawyer. Um, a graduate of, of Howard University, the Mecca, um, Howard University Law School, Moot Court Law Review, uh, also a graduate of Spelman College. And um, this poem is dedicated to Cece. Um, Elizabeth Freeman, along with uh, another uh, uh, enslaved uh, uh, African person, um, found a lawyer to sue to get her freedom. And there are sort of uh, stories that are apocryphal. We don't really know uh, that she was hit by her mistress and that's what made her seek her freedom. But when, uh, but her lawyer um, filed something called a repre replevin and what that means is to uh, file something to return property to its owner. This is the replevin of Elizabeth Freeman, also known as Mum Bet, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, May 1781. I was hit by my mistress or I was not. I stood between her and my black child or I did not. And who must speak for me in order for you to believe? If a white man says a word, that word is true, can squat upon a mountain and behold, it will spread its gospel. But if a Negro crows a vowel, it halts upon the ground until a white man says, rise. Why is it that you can lie all by yourself and walk away, but my truth is dismissed, though I bring a thousand witnesses? A white man had to plead my case in court in order for me to be free. And so at the end of my life, what I shall hold on to is a gold necklace and a gravestone inscribed with the title of efficient helper. Perhaps some kindness because I tended to white children's seeking mouths before my own child could eat. This is a longer poem and then I'm going to read the last poem that's about um, Mrs. Sutton, I think, I think we're on time. Um, so Ona Judge was a biracial um, uh, young black woman who was the 
uh, enslaved servant of Martha Washington. And um, when George Washington became president and he moved to New York, um, which, you know, at that time, that's where he moved. His, his, uh, he brought several of his enslaved servants with him, but New York was, didn't want to have slaves at that time. So what would happen is he would move them back and forth uh, before they could, you know, claim freedom. He would move them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this went on for several years. And, um, one day, uh, Ona heard, and they called her Oni, right? She heard uh, Mrs. Washington say that she planned to give her as a gift to one of their, her relatives. And um, this is the story. And so years later, uh, even though her life was rather tragic, um, some would say tragic, I just say, you know, um, we all have difficulties. And she was interviewed. And, and that's when she said, you know, I have ma been made free. The journey of Ona Judge, enslaved servant of Martha Washington, wife of President George Washington. One, from Virginia to New York. 1789. That spring mistress took me from green spoke lands and my poor mother stayed behind to tend her fear. Her dear girl quivered from her hands. Packed in a coach to New York, lonely band of powerless slaves forced to move to bend for master to leave our Virginia lands. No choices, no kind of voice. What demands could we make? We said, yes, sir. Then we went on the journey after clutching the hands of our beloveds. So long, green spoke lands and songs and family and peace and friends. I kissed my mother, then dropped from her hands. But up north, freedmen approached whispered, grand, pure clouds. My mistress couldn't keep me pinned. Those words, a paradise released, green land that hinted of trees, a river, a band song. Here you are free, your bondage must end. Then master took me to Virginia lands, my chance for freedom, laughing, in my hands. Two, Virginia to Philadelphia, 1789 through 1796. A devil's trick, a fear of letting go, a low down word took me to Southern lands, then back North again, else the law would throw me in freedom's light, my mistress's foe. She gave me wages, hugs, offered her bland smiles, meant to keep me, she would not let me go. She praised my hard work, regaled freedom's woes, told me which Negroes I could not hold hands with, talk to, smile at, or else they would throw my virtue in harsh light, find fields and so sin with this girl, make despicable plans of male trickery to make me let go of my sweet life with owners in tow. One night I heard her. While I was rambling in the hallway, she revealed that she'd throw me to her kin a gift. It was a blow to me, a loyal girl, a steady hand for mistress when grief would not let her go. At dinner time, I walked out the front door. Three the land of relative contentment, 1845. I'm a small woman, no need to be grand. Those folks dogged me, but freedom made them let go. I'm a firebrand. I took my freedom's throw. 
and and one thing I should say about this poem. So two things. It's it's a it's a double and a half, a double and a third villanelle, right? The other thing is after Oni walked out of the door, George Washington did everything to try to get her back. He sent friends. He and you know he sent them up north to talk to them. You know the whole shebang. But but it was clear that what was going to happen is she was going to be re-enslaved the moment she set foot in Virginia. And she was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> so <laughs> I love her spirit. You know, think about that. Like a young girl, a young woman, just, you know, stepping out on faith, you know, just walking out the door. And this is the last poem. Um, one of the things that I find so extraordinary about Mrs. Belinda Sutton that I have mentioned several times, um, hoping somebody else will write about it because I'm tired now and I don't know if I, I can, I can keep, keep writing everything. I mean, I'm not trying to say I'm all that, but I'm just, you know, things that I've noticed, right? This is quite possibly the first, quite possibly. I always say possibly because, you know, something would be found in somebody's attic or something like that, that an African person in, the, in North America has mentioned worshiping a traditional African religion. She says that she was worshiping the great Orisha. Um, and that is, um, that's extraordinary because that means that she was part of the Yoruba religion. Um, so I've been waiting for somebody, I guess I'm going to have to do it. I've been waiting for somebody to kind of talk about that, right? Because Mrs. Sutton could not read and write. So somebody wrote, you know, helped her write her petition. And that somebody knew, you know, about that religion. So this is for the first of several times, Belinda Sutton, former enslaved servant of the house of Isaac Royal, petitions the Massachusetts General Court for a pension in her old age, February 14, 1783. Let me just say right here, I love the fact that later on, that's Black History Month, right? And Valentine's Day. I shall trust the new word of this country, freedom. I shall not call the names of the dead. In that taken child's place, here is Belinda. Toiling in unnatural cold, I ask for bits of what you sing, what you hold so dear. I say, I have a woman's memory. Men of war, fingering silver or cowry, those men had no thought for me. Only the blue in front, cruel schemes, stricken drums. I say, I ask, for less than what is written in some book or on the gathered conscience, I know you have. More than that, too much understanding in this life remains a brick mansion. Pennies in exchange for what was taken from me. I say, I ask in my free God's names, the Orisha, Always they are here when I look around at this newfound place and I say, Ocean. Oh, Batala, I say, Shango. Yemen, ya, I say, Oya, Eshu, Elegbara. Like you, they sail and anchor where they please. And yes, they too crave. Thank y'all so much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hey, um, Brother Matt. <laughs> I was just um, 
smiling at my computer when you were reading that last poem. Um, you're such a good reader. I was, yeah, I was smiling the whole time. So thank you for everything that you just gave us. Um, and I also wanna, I know you were joking before that you became an overnight sensation um, and it took 24 years, but I've been reading your works for a very long time. And um, when we were talking really? before this started, I remember that. Yeah, I used to watch this video of you. Um, I think it was from the Red Clay Suite. I don't know. It's from, I looked it up, it's from 2005. And you recorded it with Southern Spaces and it was um, Tuscaloosa. Oh, yeah. that, oh, the one where I'm um, standing by mm -hmm. the Black Warrior River. That was actually the first poem in my um, first book. The Gospel of Barbecue. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. that was that was deep because I stood in the water mm. all day long and I called Tuscaloosa's name. And I called it and I called it and I called it and I called it and I called it. And then that night I had screaming fits all oh, my law. I had <laughs> screaming fits and I was like, I'm not doing this no more. <laughs> I don't know what that was or what was happening, but uh -huh. I'm not doing this. You know, <laughs> you know, when you call them the ancestors, sometimes they answer. Oh yeah, they do. No, uh, so, yeah. so I just wanted to to thank you for like every all the years, all the works, all the books. And I think I was drawn to that video <laughs> because um, well, I was this was okay. I, I think I watched it a few years later when I was in college, but um I think in college, just having evidence that there were other Southern writers besides the ones that I knew, you know, Alice Walker, um, at the time I was reading Natasha Trethewey, but then also finding all these other people. So I would just watch that video a lot because it just, it was just so Southern and I just really loved it. And so thank you for holding it down for the Southern writers and for the Aww, Southern. Aw, thank you, my brother. That <laughs> makes me feel so good. Cause you know, sometimes you, with poetry, you don't know who's reading it. You're like, I know my mama is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two other people. And mm -hmm. that's about it, you know, so. Um, so I have a few questions and I also okay. want to remind the audience that there'll be a brief Q&A um, when we're done having our discussion. So if you have questions, you can put them at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on the Zoom app, I don't know if you're on the browser, but there's a Q&A function and you can put your questions in there and we'll, we'll hopefully get to them. Um, okay. So I've been like, I read this book when it first came out a year ago. So I like revisited it um, for this conversation. Um, I also heard an interview you did with, I think Poetry Foundation or Poetry Magazine. Um, I used to, I listened to that a few times last oh, year. Oh yeah, so, yeah, 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 the, yeah. Uh, the podcast. Mm -hmm, yeah, 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 yeah. So coming so back to this a year later, um, I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. So, but I want to stay on the Southern topic for a minute. So how, I mean, I just love talking to Southern writers. Um, I'm from Georgia. What? Where in um, Georgia? I'm from Savannah, Georgia. Oh, okay. You know, my people are from Eatonton. Oh, Eatonton. When, oh, yeah. when you mentioned Alice Walker, my mother taught Alice Walker. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. Okay. In, in junior high school. Right. Yeah, so yeah. cool. <laughs> so, and, and there was just that fabulous conversation with um, Tiari Jones and Jericho Brown and Disha Filia with the National Book Foundation about Southern writers. So mm, yeah, just yeah. keep it going, going we're, ahead. We're everywhere. Um, so what was it like for you, or I should say, how did you being from the South and being a Southerner, how did that, or if it informed your writing of this book? I know you did lots of traveling Mm -hmm. Lots of research in the U.S., outside of the U.S., um, but also writing about events that mostly took place outside of the South. How did your um, positionality as a Southerner inform, inform that process? Well, I think that as a Southern, this is my only book that doesn't take place in the South mm -hmm. in some sort of way, right? Um, so I think that um, definitely the cadences of the, of the poetry, or rather when I read it, um, is very Southern 
because, you know, I don't know too many black Southerners who were not reared in the church, right? In, in, in the Christian church with all of its joys and difficulties. Right. <laughs> and there are many difficulties. I I don't go to church anymore, but church is still in me, you know. And so, um, you know, in particular, I stopped going to church because I just I couldn't take the homophobia. Um, you know, it just it was it, it's difficult. It was it was uh really hurting my spirit every time I would be there. And so um so I think that one of the things that that the South brings to many of us is that we're open about slavery in the South, uh, Black folks. It just, it lives with us. It's all around us. We are, uh, our lore, you know, our folklore, our food ways, all of that. And, um, there are a lot of people still who are not aware that there was slavery in the North, right? Particularly, you know, they're just like, well, we didn't have that. You're like, oh my God, you're so stupid. Um, I mean, I, I, I hate to be that way, but I'm just like, dang, you know? So I think that um, when I thought about that, I also thought about, you know, there's a there's that section on the, the Middle Passage and, and slave trade. And there are only, I guess, I think maybe seven poems. And it, and it took me so long, like years to write that um, because I would have screaming fits. I would, I would be reading. And I remember there was, a, you know, and I use the quote at the end of the book, uh, right before we get to the last book. And there's that quote from Marcus Redeker from the slave ship of human history. And he says, this is this has been a very painful book to write. And if I've done the subject any uh, justice, it will be a very painful book to read. Mm -hmm. And um, it was when you, you know, particularly that one, you know, that one poem where the, you know, this this man throws this enslaved woman into the sea. And then he is on, you know, his, there are witnesses who say that, all he said was, you know, I just hate it to lose a good chair. That, that, that he strapped her to a chair and threw her. And that's all he said. And that stayed with me. And so I began to think about my own family's, Southern families enslaved history and what was lost and can never be recovered. So I do think that, that that's what the Southern part of me, when I think about that, I think about parts of, of Miss Phyllis that can never be recovered. And then parts that are, you know, uh, fabricated because, you know, um, white folks feel, not all white folks, you know, I, I, you know, I'm very friends with, um, I mean, I know that sounds whatever, but it's true. I'm very close friends with, um, some white folks and beautiful, but um, a lot of white people feel like it's okay to just kind of make up stuff about black people. And that's what's happened with Miss Phyllis. So it, it enrages me, but it also makes me know that I tend the altars and that is my job to do to, to this altar. Okay. Um. So my next question, I feel like this is a big question, but I'm going to ask it because we, we kind of got there. So I'm more so in like my playwriting. Um, some The current poetry project I'm working on now is related to this, but I just, I mean, I was raised by Black women. You know, the men were there, but it was really like the Black women. I have tons mm -hmm. of cousins, um, you know, take we took care of each other. But also just noticing that there is, when I was very young and not knowing what this feeling was, like I just would not show men any type of like respect. <laughs> Cause I was just like, what, why should I show you this respect just because you're like the man of the family? Anyway. Why, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> why? Um, but just seeing how I, the men in my family were raised differently than the young women and even today, how, you know, I have an aunt who says, 
uh, young women should be seen and not heard. And I'm just like, no, we're, no. Um, now, okay. But, so that, yeah, then, but I heard that too growing yeah. up, but I didn't know younger folks had heard that, you know, kind of yeah. stuff. Um, and so I guess I'm interested. And then there's this, so writing about Black women, um, specifically mm-hmm. the ones that I grew up with and when I was growing up hearing stories that were not stories about black women who were told by someone else. And so someone else, another woman had another woman's story and just hearing those and how they circulate. And, you know, they were very like painful stories. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And you said you were reading and, you know, I read the book, but it's, you know, when you hear somebody read it, they just, it just jumps out. There's this line you said, and who must speak for me in order for you to believe Mm -hmm. um, in that testimony you were reading. And so I'm wondering if, if you're conscious of, as you're writing, you as a black woman are writing other black women's histories. Oh yes. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, there's their history and then yours and how they inform each other. And so like, Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you can talk about that process and specifically because in this book, there's so many voices Mm-hmm. Of black women, mm-hmm. um, especially from that section you read. So I'm happy you read from that section. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, what was that like and how does that inform your work and specifically with this book? Well, okay, so there's the, you know, there's the official story, right? And then there's the real story. Mm-hmm. The official story is, um, you know, I, I, I came gradually to write this uh, book imagining the life and times of Phyllis Wheatley Peters. And then I wanted to write a, you know, a, a sort of, I noticed that uh, except for in Tara Bynum's work, um, that there's not a lot of discussion about other Black people in her oeuvre right they're they're or milieu rather so they're you know they're just you know like she's just there you know the fly in the buttermilk and we know about the wheatleys and we know about this but we don't you know and then every once in a while we'll hear about over tanner but we don't have a lot so th- the official story is i wanted to create a, a a book of poetry that was really a complete as complete as it can be. I mean, and of course, I'm not doing this work alone. There are other scholars who are doing this work, right? Derek Spires, Joanna Brooks, Tara Bynum, um, Vincent Carretta. So they're all of us and we're all doing, you know, some um, Joseph Rezik. So there are all these people doing this sort of work, right? But the true story is real story is, um, you know, and I always say this, I came to bless, okay? I came to bless and I came because I was chosen. I did not want to do this work. It's one thing to write a few poems in a thin book and blah, 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 but it is quite another to spend, you know, nearly a third of your life researching the book, right? Um, so when you ask me, you know, how does it feel telling other women's stories? I pray, I pray and they, and they tell me which of those stories I can write and which of those stories I can't, I can't write. You know, one of the things is, um, I wasn't sure that I had the skills. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping very delicately through this. I wanted to write, um, uh, poems about queer African-Americans. I didn't feel like I had the skills yet to do that, okay? Um, and and I didn't want to mess that up. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to mess that up. Um, the same way with my fiction. Now I feel like I have some skills and I've had some uh, queer characters that showed up, but I didn't feel like I could foreground them until I could do it right. You know, because the worst thing is like when you see a white person write a black, a black, you know, a black uh, a character and you're like, that didn't go right. Yeah, that's not. I, it. I, and I didn't want somebody saying that about me. 
But I, but I felt like, you know, this was my ministry to write, you know, about these women. But I do feel, and again, I don't know if I'm saying this right. I feel like even when Black women are cisgender and heterosexual, their story is still a queer story because we do not inhabit femininity the way that, you know, the cult of domesticity has said that we inhabit it, right? So it is and it isn't, if that makes sense. You know, it, it is and it isn't. And again, I don't have the skills yet to be able to, I want somebody else to, you know, to do that, to sort of, to sort of talk about how, you know, Black women are inhabiting a different kind of femininity. Um, and I've always, often wondered, did we come over like this? Or did it, did it change on the middle passage? And I've, you know, I've wondered about that. But so telling these stories about Black women and the stories that are not mine, you do the research and you can do as much research as you can. But then you have to set aside the research and you have to, you have to go inside. And when they go, when you go inside, sometimes there's vision, there's, there's ancestral vision, spiritual vision. Sometimes you connect with them in some, in some sort of way. Um, Sometimes there are intersections. For example, you know, when I had the found poems about the little kids that um, uh, were separated from their parents, that's trafficking. I, I don't really feel like people, and, and we know, unfortunately, some of those children who have disappeared, they probably were sold, mm -hmm. you know? And we don't want to accept that, right? Um, we don't. We don't want to do that. But slavery is ongoing, and so when I had that, I wanted to say that there are other things. As a, a woman who, a grown woman who was an abused child, right? To be in a house where you both love and despise your caretaker, right? And what does that mean? What is the complication of that, you know? So there are some things that I can draw upon and others I cannot, you know? And then I pray, I prayed a lot, you know? This took a lot from me. I got a gray streak in my hair, um, you know? It, it took a lot, it, 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 it opened my spirit and it may, I won't say it made me weaker, but it made me more fragile and I don't think I'll ever get back certain strengths that I lost doing this work. Um, but it was, you know, it was my work to do. And, um, and I accepted that charge, but it's hard, it's hard work. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, just wanna remind people to put your questions in the Q and A box if you have some. Um, but going along with the found poems you just mentioned, and there's a, um, in my second reading of this, the poem that has Black Lives Matter in the title. Mm -hmm. um, and then thinking about Mrs. Sutton's poem that you read, and Mrs. Sutton, who was housed at the Royal House. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, how does, or how did you know that there needed to be, that the book also needed to address moments in the future, like not just the 1700s, 1800s, but moments in the future and like um, contemporary life. How, how did you know that that is what the book needed? And, and how was it to go from writing about what was happening back then to, you know, a more contemporary where it's like very real happening like in the moment? Well, one thing is, you know, for example, when we look at John Peters, Mr. Mr. John was um, in jail, probably. We know this from Vincent Coretta's. Um, thank you so much, Tony B. I appreciate you, um, my sister. 
um, when we go to, you know, we, we, we see that he was probably, you know, Vincent Coretta's work, he was probably in, in jail. Then what we know because of debt and what we know is that there are black people in jail right now because of debt. And, um, you know, it seems simplistic to say, uh, you know, you know, you, you know, you have Ray Ray and Pookie say this just like slavery, you know, <laughs> this is just like slavery, you know, but at the same time, you know, to, you know, I have quoted uh, William Faulkner uh, so much. I'm, I'm, I'm not drinking beer. I'm drinking pineapple juice. <laughs> William Faulkner so much in the past few weeks, but and I never thought I would quote him because he was a racist and a classist. Um, but um, <laughs> when he said, um, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past, mm -hmm. okay? So when you look at, for example, I mean, it's amazing to me how many white people in the United States, and when I say white, that is not an accusation, it's a descriptor, right? How many white people and black people do not know that over 5,000 black men fought on the side of the revolution? And so many, I, I you know, I'm not, I don't do uh, Northern um, Native American history, but there were a bunch of Native Americans who fought on both sides. There, there were 5,000 Black men who fought on the revolutionary side and something like 40 or 50,000 who fought for the British, right? Well, when the British came, they were a police force, okay? So that's why it's called Original Black Lives Matter. Because when Crispus Attucks was the first person to fall in the uh, what became later known, at, at first it was the affray, right, on King Street, but later became known as the Boston Massacre. Um, you know, they were they were they were getting into it with with the police, you know, with the with the with the soldiers, right? So there are so many parallels between, you know, between what is happening now and what is happening, the way that the military was used mm -hmm. against Black Lives Matter. Like I, I couldn't have thought that up in a million years, yeah. you know? And then, uh, you know, what, three, four months after my book comes out, there it is, right? Mm -hmm. The jail, the all of that, the fact that, um, you know, Miss Phyllis had bad health. Um, you know, we we know that black people's um, black black people's illnesses many times are ignored. You know, Chiari uh, Jones was saying something very very brilliant. It was um, on the on the National uh, Book Award. Um, a Zoom uh, lecture where she was saying people talk about black people don't want to get the. Uh, the, 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 the Corona vaccine, because that is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to curse. That's insert expletive. We can't get the vaccine. We can't get the vaccine. So all of this about, we don't want to air black person. I know want the vaccine. Right. Okay, so I don't know any black people that don't want the vaccine. Every time I, you know, get up on one of my dear friends is on here, um, uh, a brilliant, beautiful poet, uh, Bailey Hoffner. Um, I'm waiting on her book. Bailey, I hope she doesn't get embarrassed by saying this. Bailey will text me. Here you go. You know, here's the portal. I love you too. And, and here's the portal. And I go up in there. They were like, you were not eligible. You were not eligible. I'm like, oh, oh, my goodness. So, yes. Yeah, so there are all of these parallels between the past and the present. Um, and unfortunately, they, you know, what we saw on January the 6th is, you know, whoo, -hoo -hoo, I was like, I mean, I was watching it and I was just, you know, screaming to God. Cause I was like, please, I can't go back there. I, I, 
because I've done enough research to know how bad it, it truly is. You know, we can't go back here. So anyway, um, somebody asked something in the Q&A. Yes, actually, uh, Bailey asked the question. Okay. Um, so you can see it on your end and I'll, I'll read it for the audience. Okay. Um, as an archivist, I'm really interested in how you find all of the information that you did about the muses. How much of this was from your own existing awareness of these women and their lives and how much was from discoveries during all of your deep research? Okay, so um, I just like encounter the story of Ona Judge. Most early Americanists, <clears throat> Um, who, you know, have PhDs, I don't have a PhD, they, um, which either makes me look like I'm not as smart as everybody else or makes me look like, you know, I'm a deep nerd, right? So who knows one way or the other, right? But um, I was just fiddling around in the George Washington papers and on the, on the right side of the screen popped up this story about Ona Judge and then I started going into the George Washington papers. Those are online, okay? So, you know, a lot of these archives have been digitized. Um, others, you, you, have to, you have to go up in there. Um, I, I was a fellow at the American Antiquarian Society. And so I was, I was able to, um, you know, have the, the great librarians there, Elizabeth Watts Pope, Ashley Cataldo, their curators at the library. Um, so a lot of this, but some of this is stuff that just I remember like WB Du Bois, you know, will just throw out certain things, right? And and then I'm like, didn't Du Bois say da 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 da? So yes, some of it I already knew, but most of it came from reading secondary. Um, scholarship, second, you know, secondary books, and then I would go into the archives to find more. Okay. Okay. Um, our next question is from Dorothy Clark. Even today, many people marvel at the genius of Phyllis Wheatley Peters, that genius being that a Black child could be smart and intelligent. I think her genius was in surviving what was done to her, not that she had the capacity to read, write, and craft poetry. Can you comment a bit on that? I think, I think she was an emotional genius. I also think she was an intellectual genius. I think that we need to be very clear that Susanna Wheatley and John Wheatley were not responsible for her genius, that she was between seven and eight years old when she arrived in Boston. And what we know about early childhood education is that parents um, stamp, you know, a lot of education onto their children. So when we see a little kid, by the time they're seven or eight years old, their parents have given them a lot. The other thing is that we uh, need to be very clear on is that there was a lineage of Black female literacy in the Gambia, in, in Muslim West Africa. And uh, the discoverer Mungo Park uh, white uh, a British man uh, spoke about uh, in the 18th century seeing black women read Arabic and write Arabic. So, um, so on the one hand, I think, you know, she was a genius. I mean, um, I'm still struggling with French. <laughs> I'm, st I'm still struggling to learn Wolof. Um, but you know, I'm an older person. So your brain is not as, you know, malleable. Um, but I do think that all Black people, even now, have to have the genius of improvisation to be able to make it in white spaces. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, to not, you know, you know, Dave Chappelle used to have this skit when keeping it real goes wrong. <laughs> to not, you know, <laughs> scream and holler and, you know, go off. Um, I experienced racist microaggressions um, nearly weekly. Uh, so, you know, sometimes I can go two weeks and I'm like, Ooh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, this is really great. <laughs> but, 
Uh, but um, so I think that, you know, being able, and when we think about she was in the 18th century, right. you know, navigating the, and, and what people were saying to her. Like when we look at that poem on being brought from Africa to America, and it's in quotation marks where it says, their color is a diabolic dye. That's not her saying that. That's somebody else saying that about her. So, mm -hmm. so and then this one. Can yep. This is from um, Sarah Harrell. Mm -hmm. Can you speak more about your reclamation or recreation of epic and the muses for Miss Phyllis, who makes so many classical references in her poetry? Well, she makes Western classical, you know, Greek uh, classical references and um, West Africans have their own epics, you know, going back to Sunjata. Um, uh, in, in Mali. Uh, that's the first that we, we now have, that's the first extant one, but we, you know, th there's all sorts of work being done as we speak. Um, it used to be that people would say, uh, West Africans had no literature. They haven't been all of a sudden they found that people were burying <laughs> manuscripts in their backyard to keep them from, you know, in, 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 um, chests and stuff to keep them from being burnt, you know, up and all of that. So um, for me, it was both a, an acknowledgement that Miss Phyllis was very much influenced by Alexander Pope, okay? Um, but it was also, um, I wanted people to be very clear that this was an African woman, okay? This is not a white person in blackface. Okay, this is a black woman. Her best friend is black. She married a black man. She had black friends, right? Um, we know from Tara Bynum's work that she was friends with black people in Newport, Rhode Island. So I wanted to, to, to rewrite the epic and the muses are the women that surround her. And then if you look in the, um, and then I, I guess we should start wrapping up. When you look in the um, notes, you'll see um, references to this poem is written after Rita Doves, like the, the poem that I read uh, uh, about in the voice of Mrs. Belinda Sutton is written after Rita Doves Belinda's petition. This poem is written after um, Nikki Giovanni's, you know, uh, uh, this. This poem is written after. And what I wanted to do is create this both um, 18th century as well as contemporary community because she is the mother of African American literature. Um, and so I, I wanted people to understand that she is still loved. She is still revered and, um, and we wouldn't be here, you know, without her. Very true. That's very true. Um, thank you so much for the reading, for the questions. I took down some notes while we, you were reading and talking. So um, this has been really special and great. So. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, and I'll be on Twitter for the after party. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Jeffers. Today's event moved me so much. Um, I just want to say thank you again for sharing your work with us. Um, I also want to thank you for um, also educating us about, you know, using Phyllis Wheatley Peters. I know we didn't really talk about that that much, but oh, thank that you. is her chosen name. And so that's very um, important and special um, to hear you thank say you that my you talked about um, uh, Miss Phyllis throughout your reading. Um, and I also want to thank you for connecting, um, for talking about your work and reading your poem about Belinda Sutton and connecting it to the importance of the history of slavery in the North and particularly how Black women um, lived through slavery, created during slavery, and then ultimately helped overthrow the legal institution of slavery. Right. We'll That's talk right. about 
that. Um, so if you um, enjoyed this program, and I know you did, please go visit your local bookstore to purchase Professor Jeffers' marvelous book, The Age of Phyllis. Uh, Malcolm is holding it up right there. Um, Thank you, you, brother Malcolm. <laughs> If you enjoy this program, please visit our website at theroyalhouse.org to become a member, learn more about the work we do, and to keep up with our programs. You can follow us on Twitter at Royal House, Instagram at Royal House 1737, and on Facebook at Royal House Institute. Royal House Slave Quarters. You can follow Professor Jeffers um, on Twitter at Black Library Girl. We put that in the, uh, the chat. And you can follow Malcolm on Twitter at Malcolm Tariq, first and last name. So just thank you um, both so much for giving us your time tonight. Uh, I would love to thank the audience for tuning in. This has been a really, really amazing conversation. Um, and I'm really excited for the novel that's coming out, Professor Jeffers. So, well, I, I, I just, Miss Singleton, you are just a ray of sunshine. Your warmth just beams through the computer. Thank you, Brother Malcolm, for those brilliant. Um, questions and and the the fellowship and I have really really enjoyed this. Um, yes, the novel is the love songs of W. B. Du Bois um, is coming out on July the twenty seventh. So, well, we yeah. might be asking you to come back. I would <laughs> love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. I'm not going to turn it in. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, have a great night, everyone. Thank you again for tuning in. And thank you again, Professor Jeffers and Malcolm. It was thank my pleasure. So my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>